Craig, we'll go ahead and get the meeting called to order. Thank you, all board members and Dr. Daniel, for making time and short notice to be here at 10. Um, it's a tough time, it's a challenging time, unknown time, but I'm ready to hear the district's plan for COVID-19. So welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Paul Lewis. Present. Carl Sidri. Present. Mr. Bud. Terry Jacobs. Here. Mark Mann. Present. Ruth Fields. Gloria Therese. Present. Meg McElhaney. Present. We have a call. Thank you. Okay, so the reason for the emergency meeting and board action, uh, declare an emergency. So we're going to, um, I'll go ahead and make a motion for that. Uh, do we need to read that into the record or just make the motion and then you'll have it? Um, I think to put some meat on the bone of the motion. I'll read it. I got it right here. I'm pull it up. And I've been told we need to speak up a little bit. Okay. A bit of the live screen. <laughs> All right. So 2.01. This emergency meeting was called as an emergency exists with regards to COVID-19 as it impacts our OKCPS community of students, staff, volunteers, and patrons. Given that this is an emergency meeting, we're illegally only able to address COVID-19. I make a motion to declare an emergency. I move that we declare COVID-19 an emergency which involves injury to persons in our community. Is there a second for that? Second. All right, now we will open the floor to Dr. McGann for discussion. Oh, we need a vote. Okay, call, call for the vote. Paula Lewis. Yes. Charles Henry. Yes. Terry Jacobs. Yes. Mark Mann. Yes. Corey Perez. Yes. Meg McElhaney. Yes. Having received six I votes, zero nay votes, the motion carries as made. Right, Dr. McGann. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just, just uh, for informational purposes, I want to talk about what has happened in the last uh, 48 hours or so uh, that brings us to this point. We know that uh, the governor and the mayor both have declared states of emergency. Uh, we know that uh, Superintendent Hoffmeister and the State Board of Education followed up with an extension of spring break for two weeks. It would take us up until April 6th. And so clearly this has uh, enormous impact on all districts, uh, in particular Oklahoma City Public Schools. So a lot of what we wanted to report out on uh, and brief the board on ha has been addressed uh, through the state board action. So what we know in the state board action, the things that uh, were impacted uh, that will not exist during the two-week extension would be things like instruction. There will be no instruction, there will be no grading, there will be no professional development, there will be uh, no conferences. And so in that action by the State Board, it covered a lot of what we were making plans for as a local district. What that action did not cover, which is up to the local districts, are really a couple of things that I want to talk about today uh, and then entertain questions that you might have. One is how we're going to feed our kids. Uh, that is high on everybody's list of uh, information, what's the district going to do, so I want to talk a little bit about that. And the second thing that is kind of a 1B to that is how are we going to pay our employees, particularly our hourly employees? And speaking to, to members of the board, uh, the community, our, our staff, and, and our parents and grandparents are concerned about that thing as well. So I want to address that a little bit. Um, as important as anything, I think, on this agenda is something that I'm going to be asking the board for, which is delegating authority to me to make some decisions. Um, this is happening so rapidly, even by the hour. If, if you've been paying attention at all, things change very rapidly. And we will not have the, the luxury of each time something significant changes to reconvene this board. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to need some discretion in decision making. Um, so let's start there. I want to start with employee pay. Uh, our goal, our ideal, and I know it is the same ideal of this board, is to get our people paid as usual. Um, how we do that is a work in progress, and it may be uh, it may be things like granting additional leave. It may be that um, we establish different work opportunities for employees. It may be outside of what they would typically do, but we want to have them come in in rotations uh, to try and get get work done. An example would be maintenance and operations. 
uh, maybe security where we need to sweep our campuses during this, this time just to make sure that everything's safe and secured. Um, we do not have a final plan yet, but, but our commitment as a team uh, to our community and to this board is within 48 hours we will have a complete feeding plan uh, and we will have a plan to pay our employees. So that's a 48 hour, so if you move 48 hours ahead, and that, that's the outside. As soon as we have it fully developed, we will we will take it out to our stakeholders. Uh, Sean, how long have you been working on this plan? Uh, we we've, we've been working on this plan since the walkout. I mean, so we have frameworks in place. The big difference, I and mean, we do have some sort of a blueprint from the walkout for some of this. Clearly, the difference is during the walkout, we wanted people together, uh, and we wanted to uh, approach the issue at that time. Here, um, we have employee groups that are waiting uh, for, for what the plan is because they are afraid to come to work. And that's bus drivers, that's child nutrition employees. Every employee group, there is some level of anxiety because we don't know exactly what this COVID-19 is. And so they are saying, I don't want to drive a bus. I don't want to come and serve food. I don't want to be in a class with uh, 25 kids. All, all of those things are coming to us very, very rapidly um, from our employees, our parents, our grandparents, uh, and, and our community at large. And so um, we have been working on framework for a long time. I know this district has well before I came. Uh, so we have pieces in place. But because of the nature of this, this virus, we're having to tweak plans a little bit. Um, go ahead. Yeah, this please. This is really our hourly wage employees, our teachers. The, our, our correct. Year-round contracts, teachers, they're covered by what the Department of Ed took action to do yesterday, correct? Where we can continue to pay them. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so we're covered uh, through statute, but we're locally covered also through our collective bargaining agreements. Okay. Okay, so teachers, for example, truly this becomes in many ways an extended spring break. So uh, our collective bargaining agreement speaks to uh, when does a teacher have to, for example, make up? And the answer is if a student is out, and we use inclement weather as an example, and a teacher is out, there is no makeup for the teacher. Okay, that's just, it's a day uh, that, that they are away from their job. So we have guidance from policy, from statute, uh, that will help us answer a lot of these questions. So yes, we're specifically talking about the hourly employee. And we hope to be able to address the wage of the hourly employee through additional leave. Um, in some instances, and I'm going to use our SNS employees, our child nutrition employees as an example. As we get into the plan for feeding, we're going to need to staff sites. So if we, for example, if we identify a number of sites where it's going to be the hub for feeding, mm -hmm. we create a window. Um, we haven't established the hours yet, but there'll be a window where people can come by, grab a meal, and go. We have to have staffing at those sites. And so we are considering now adding a daily stipend for the SNS employee to get them to come and staff a site. Um, we're still working on finalizing what that number will be, how much per day. Um, and so, so it's important that we get all the details in place before we start releasing information in pieces. We don't want to do that. And we believe that 48 hours from now uh, gives us that time uh, to nail this down, to be very specific about which sites, what's the window, how much are we paying our SNS employees uh, per day? If we grant additional leave, what does that look like? Who gets the additional leave? All these questions are, we're mulling this over and have been for, for some time. And we'll have those answers uh, very quickly. So let's move into um, how we're going to feed our kids. We started with an ideal, and the ideal was we wanted to feed our kids as they are fed now. You know that 100% of our kids get, get the free breakfast and the free lunch. So we want to feed two meals every day as long as we're out. So that means we've probably got to open up a window at our sites. So we're thinking 8.30, 9 o'clock through 11.30 or 12. And again, 
we will nail all of this down uh, very quickly so that families, kids have an idea of where I need to go to get my meals, how long is that site open, do I get to go in and sit down in the cafeteria or do I grab and go? And our position is we don't want to get inside the buildings. Uh, there's a whole different level of management that has to occur then. We really just want to get food to, and nutrition to our kids. And so... Uh, do you, have, um, do you have an idea of how many sites we would have? I don't remember how many we had in the walkout. Well, in the walkout, we started big. Mm -hmm. And then as we saw how people turned out to the different sites, that shrunk. I think we started out within the 20s. We had 20-some different sites. When the walkout ended, we had, we had narrowed down to six sites. Um, and so we may take that same approach. I would rather start broad. Uh, so we're thinking every elementary site as an example. And then maybe additional one-off sites uh, to bridge the gap for some of our kids who may live northeast. In the northeast area, um, there is quite a distance from some of those neighborhoods to their nearest uh, elementary school. So we may identify another site. Uh, we've been in contact with uh, city manager Craig Freeman. He has given us the green light to use any park that is available in our city. Um, not the facility, but the, the green spots so, so that we could park a bus we could set up tables uh, put our sack lunches um, so that that might be in closer proximity for our kids um, Sean is that something that we can partner with any of our uh, community churches absolutely uh, again lots of lots of outreach from our side and also from our community partners saying you tell us what we need to do and we're there we've been offered uh, transportation we've been offered if you need you know if you have a list of people who can't get out and you want us to deliver to their homes we would be willing to do that many of our churches have uh, stepped up to say uh, that we would be in for that our after-school program sponsors everybody is on board the United Way certainly our foundation so this is a team effort and because it's a team effort we feel very confident that that the deployment of meals is going to be successful. Would, would there be an avenue to distribute, say, in the morning breakfast and lunch, so there's only one trip made? That, that is, uh, yeah, that's a great I'm point. So, so the answer to that is yes. Um, as you probably heard from Superintendent Hoffmeister, they applied for four different waivers from the federal government. We've been approved for two, which allows us some flexibility in how we deploy meals. Um, one of the things we've talked about is let's include in a one-time visit uh, an option where it has the breakfast and the lunch together so that that family doesn't have to come in the morning, leave, come back. That's just not practical for a lot of our families. And so we're looking at options like that. And that, again, in our, in our plan, all of that will be detailed out. So our families know exactly what their options are, exactly the location. And, and, and I want to make sure we understand this as well, that as a designated location, let's say it's an elementary school, that does not mean that only the elementary school kids that go to that school get to go. It's anyone up to 18 years of age, and even 21 if they're on an IEP, they can come in uh, to any location that's open and, and get a meal. And so we're, uh, we're happy about that, that it's not designated just by neighborhood. Uh, any of our kids that come in can, can pick up a meal. Okay. Yes, sir. I appreciate the uh, concerns with the meals, but has there been any consideration about <coughs> the safety concerns of, <coughs> excuse me, of the cafeteria workers uh, being exposed or other measures? Um, I know some of the masks don't work, but there are some filter masks that do work. So has there been any consideration uh, to make sure to provide them that they don't get exposed? And also another thing is, you know, as far as serving food, as far as the parents or families getting exposed, because you mentioned about a window, but you also mentioned about the park. So if there's a, is there a situation or has it been looked into whether there's multiple families or multiple parents being present at the same time, causing families to be exposed, not by the workers, but maybe possibly being exposed by some of the other parents. So I think we need to make sure that we have all those safety measures in place so that there would be no exposure to our employees and also to our families as well. So we have, we have talked a lot about that, uh, Mr. Henry. So, so the management at each site is going to be important. At each site, we'll have a child nutrition worker. Likely, we'll have an administrator. Uh, likely, we'll have one or two teachers who are not going to be required to come, but we know through the walkout, they want to see their kids. And so 
will manage the staffing and then what we plan to do is for every staff member who's going to be at a site, we will take their temperature every day so that if they are at risk uh, or they are uh, have a temperature or a symptom of some sort, we'll turn them back home and ask them to quarantine and we won't have them back and then we'll fill in with a sub uh, for that position. Um, we have also talked about how to manage uh, the kids and families that show up and, and we're going to practice the social distancing even even then, so we'll have uh, a staff member who greets the kids and the families as they come. We'll stagger them, so it's not just everybody rushing a table and getting hands on food. So it'll be an organized uh, process so that we can make sure we do everything we're able to do to, to manage the situation. With the thought in mind, we've got to feed our kids, and so we know that in order to do that, there are some other questions that pop up that we've got to resolve. And, and uh, so I appreciate that question. It's a good one. Another one, Dr. McGinnis. Yeah. So we have a lot, significant amount of our kids that take backpacks home for a weekend. Do we have any community partners who are still providing backpacks that they'll be able to pick up on Fridays? Or do we know that yet? We, we have had some level of communication about that. We're trying to get answers even as we speak today. And, and so the board knows. Um, Today, we're going to work remotely until 2 o'clock, our staff, um, and we're, we're still answering a lot of these questions and getting answers from our partners. Uh, we have another conference call today at 2 o'clock with the state superintendent, and she will give us additional guidance for things that are specifically related to COVID-19. Uh, we got the word, as you heard, that there, was no, there is no instruction and no grading, but like any break, for Oklahoma City Public Schools, we still inform our community of parents and grandparents and kids. Here are some free resources mm -hmm. if you're able to access them. Uh, and we list out and give links to resources. And we've had lots of questions from parents, from guardians, from teachers and administrators. Are we allowed to notify parents about resources that exist? And we believe the answer is yes. We're, we're gonna get additional guidance today uh, on our two o'clock conference call. So, a l not a lot, some of, some of the information is still in flux. And again, what we wanna do is be very specific about what we know and what we are not sure of yet. And so, you know, each conference call, each webinar, each meeting, we know a little bit more. So in that 48 hour window, we, we believe we're gonna be able to give really strong guidance uh, with regard to feeding and with regard to uh, pay of employees. Uh, back on the feeding. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try to speak in. Now, you know, I was going to say, I'm getting messages that people aren't able to hear. I don't know if there's anything we can do I'll with the do microphones. My, I'll do my best. Our Just gotta speak up. Speak up. Um, okay. On the issue of feeding kids up to the age of 18, if a family arrives and they have, say, two school age kids that are first in kindergarten, what about the two kids that aren't in school yet? Are they covered, or is that going to be a no? There will be. Hey, you you so what, uh, okay. The question. The question was: As families come, school-age kids come to our feeding sites, and they might have siblings who are not yet in school. Yes. The question is: Do we turn them away, or do we give them a meal? We're not going to turn kids away from a meal. Uh, we're not checking IDs. We're not. We want to make sure our kids get fed. And so, if a kid approaches us. Um, we're going to feed kids that come come to our table. So, great question, important question. Anybody else? Okay. Carrie, any questions, comments? Okay. I've got a final question. If we're wrapping that up, okay. um, obviously we're closed by the State Department of Ed through April sixth, and I think I know the answer to this based on our conversations yesterday. But we're preparing and laying groundwork and beyond that if necessary, correct? So the, the question was, are we preparing as a district beyond the two week, the April 6th? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, as, as we get more information, as we you know, follow the, the guidance of the CDC and the State Health Department, o Oklahoma City County Health, and the agencies that we're paying attention to, if a time comes where they say we're going to extend again, that then takes on a different layer and a different look, uh, and we will return to many of these categories that we 
got some coverage for yesterday when Superintendent Hoffmeister extended spring break. Now we're looking at more of a long term and we'll have to revisit what does instruction look like? How do we take care of uh, our most vulnerable kids? Um, I just want people watching on the live stream. Yeah, you know, absolutely. We're, we're we are. In just two weeks. We're no, thinking. that's good. Thank you for that. We're, and we are talking every day uh, about what it looks like beyond April 6th. Yes. I do have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, so back to paying staff. Uh, will all of our staff be able to maintain their insurance through however long COVID-19 lasts? That is our goal, and we believe that to be the case. And so, and will they be accruing PTO even though they're not clocking in, or how does their, or do they just have a set amount? Well, we go by our contracts. Our contracts for each employee group set out what their benefits are, mm -hmm. uh, and so they will get to keep those benefits. In addition to that, we're examining what might work best. The the board has the authority. I have the authority through regulation to to provide additional leave as necessary. Uh, and so we're going to explore all of those options so that all of our employees can continue to get paid. That is the goal. And then this is a question kind of as a parent and the board chair. So if kids aren't in school, will it affect them progressing to the next grade? Like how do they meet their academic goals and get where they're supposed to be? So that's a question on everybody's mind. We believe we're gonna to continue to get guidance from uh, the state superintendent, the state board, and other agencies. Uh, it's a tough one. I mean, just practically, as you as you think about that, you know, we've got some of our other states that have already, districts have already canceled uh, through August. And so these are questions that they're asking now. We want to learn from that, uh, and then we want to get guidance from our agencies uh, on how, how to deal with this. And, you know, just reminding everybody that nobody has been through this before. And so uh, we are seeking guidance from all directions. We're using common sense, but we're taking this very, very seriously uh, so that, A, number one, we protect the safety and well-being of our kids and our families and our staff first. And then all of these other things, we have started a master list of questions and concerns that we need answers to. Those answers will come from outside uh, or from within as we see what the nature of the question concern is. So, so work in progress, but today we really wanted to be uh, thoughtful about particularly these two areas, how to, how to meet the nutritional needs of our kids and how to take care of our employees. Online classes and programs, is that part of the, you know, if, we, if it's extended past April 6th, are we looking at possible online? I, I, I think those are options we've got to take a look at. For, for now, just the two-week extension, um, that, that is a no. That is a, a very clear no from the State Department, the State Board. There will be no instruction, no grading, etc. If it extends, Mr. Henry, yes, I think we have to return to that conversation uh, and see what that looks like. Clearly, the, the challenge for us in particular when we start talking about online learning is we have thousands of our kids who do not have access. So there's an equity issue there. Even if we provide uh, instructional packets, you know, hard copy, and a combination of online learning, we have a, a whole nother population of kids uh, who have special needs that need accommodations. And so th this is a, I mean, this is a work in progress and it's a moving target for us. But the short answer is yes, if it extends, we've got to return to instruction uh, and have that conversation again, for sure. Um, this year we implemented uh, inclement weather leave, and is there a possibility that there could be a similar pandemic leave? Great. So the question is, uh, our board implemented uh, inclement weather leave this year. The question is, can we implement a similar pandemic leave? We can do that under a number of different headings. We already have administrative leave in this district, which is a paid leave. Um, we could extend the number of inclement weather days. We can call it really what we want with the thought in mind is we, we want to make sure that our employees are not being penalized uh, through this, through this uh, COVID-19 issue. Um, Great question. I know Superintendent Hoffmeister alluded to this yesterday and the legislature talked about it. If there is a need for us to meet again, is there a way to do that via teleconference or are we prohibited from that? So the question is, uh, can the board meet via teleconference? There are some guidelines that, that the state gives us on how to do that. And typically, uh, it's audio and video have to be in place. Uh, 
Um, so there is a, there's a pathway for that. Um, and you know, as we move forward and get additional information, you know, we're hearing from all different directions, no more than 50, no more than 10 was the most recent guidance given. And so, you know, gatherings like this where we may have 20 or so in a room. I'm thinking if five of us actually contracted COVID-19. Right. Then, then we, so have, we, a have, we have, 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 have a pathway for that. For yes, that. yes, yeah. yes. I had another question about um, purchasing. Does the state declaration of emergency free up staff to be able to purchase things as they need them? Or does that come from our, what we're doing today? I just want to make sure you guys are able to take care of what you need to take care of without Good. Like, you know, So the question, the question has to do with purchasing. And, you know, in a typical board cycle, those are the things that we would bring to the board. We'd secure the purchase order. We would get approval mm -hmm. and we'd go buy here. What I'm asking for today is for you to delegate some authority to me to bypass some of that uh, so that as we see needs arise, I can make a decision on behalf of the board without reconvening the board uh, to take those necessary steps. With, with that um, emotional comment, I'm, to give you that, we will be, you'll send out information on, to us pretty routinely Absolutely. on anything Absolutely. that you're making that would typically have been a board. Yes. Yes. With that, you make a motion, Mark. I make a motion uh, that we grant the superintendent the authority to make decisions regarding all aspects of Oklahoma City Public Schools' response to the COVID-19 um, mitigation measures, including but not limited to staffing, additional leave, purchasing, and other issues related to employees and students. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion on this motion? Okay. Call for the vote. Paul Lewis. Yes. Charles Henry. Yes. Carrie Jacobs? Yes. Mark Mann? Yes. Corey Torres? Yes. Dave McElhaney? Yes. Having received six I votes, zero day votes, the motion carries as made. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, how will. So, prior to the 20 months, I don't think I'm on either. How will. I'm not sure. It's really. How, how, well, give me to read the second part, 2.02, where we're at, and it may fall into it. I don't know if you're back on. 2.02. Okay, let me read that one. So, 2.02. We appreciate action by the Oklahoma State Board of Education to close all Oklahoma public schools until April 6th. As we learn more about COVID-19 with each passing hour, it is imperative that we delegate authority to our superintendent, Dr. McDaniel, to make decisions for OKCPS regarding COVID. While we would not expect Dr. McDaniel to seek prior board approval and decisions regarding COVID-19, this board does expect frequent communication on those decisions. This delegated authority to Dr. McDaniel includes, but is not limited to, the decisions that were spoken of in the, act, the item we just voted on. So, okay, Gloria. Communication, not just to the board, however, to the community as a whole. Prior to the meeting, we did a couple of Facebook Lives. We're doing Facebook Live now. Right. What are the other means of communication to the community as a whole? Just in case anybody didn't hear the question, uh, Lori is talking about methods of communication, not just to the board, but to our community as a whole. We will take advantage of every means available to us, including all of our social media. We, we use robocalls uh, pretty consistently. We have pushes through email, through text. Uh, we have great partners uh, in, in our local media uh, who have been very helpful in making sure that any messages we have get out to our community at large. Uh, we, we communicate daily with community partners who also have clients and others that they then communicate with. So every means uh, at our disposal. If someone has a question, uh, we're, we're working on revamping our FAQs as we speak and that will be back up. Uh, by the end of the day, tomorrow, within our 48 hours for certain. Um, they can reach out to me personally on, on my email, and we take that then into staffing and respond back out. So any possible way we can to communicate, we will take advantage of, of those opportunities. Well, I can't think what I was going to ask. Anybody else have something to help stimulate my brain? No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. McDaniel, for the update. Thank you for all of you who joined us. Joined us by Facebook uh, Live. And...
Again, we're taking this completely serious and we're working as hard as we can. We trust our leadership in the district, strong leadership. I can't say enough how much the cabinet works and has kids first every single time. And I'm proud of this board for coming in and making decisions. Students and families that have um, been out of the country or more severely exposed, do we have a protocol that we've already established for prior to coming back to school? So, so the question was about basically quarantine. Um, if we have uh, families, employees that we know have left the country, we, we some time ago, maybe a week, week and a half ago, we put out information uh, asking for them to self-identify. We have left the country, we have gone to a place where there's known exposure uh, or transmission of some sort. We have asked them to self-quarantine and alert the district. And so uh, we, we, uh, we will continue to visit that and get additional guidance from CDC. But that's, that's how we've approached it so far. That actually reminded me of my question. Okay. So with kid, will we be able to find out from uh, County Health or anybody if we have a child who has been Great tested question. positive? Great question. So the question is, how do we know as a district if one of our students, staff, parents, uh, have been affected. We are notified directly as a school district by the Oklahoma City County Health Department or the Department of Public Health. So if a student tests positive, um, we are then notified. I don't remember the, the turnaround time, but it's very quickly. And then we can, we can take uh, action immediately once we get that information. Thank you, Dr. McDaniel. All right. One more? Nope. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Mark Mann. Is there a second? Second. Okay, call for the vote. All those are all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, motion carried.